All right, so my topic for this lecture right, is game theory, and I like to add the like, kind of subtitle an entrepreneurial twist. Right, so just to give kind of a little bit of background about game theory, uh, first kind of in the mainstream. Right, so I think that game theory kind of had its, uh, its heyday in the mainstream of economics around the time that John Nash got the uh, Nobel Prize right, for his contributions to game theory. And I think that like often happens, I find, in the mainstream of economics, it, it, uh, they believe that uh, economics, like, a, like any science, develops kind of the way physics does, right? and that you have like, a main uh, a sort of paradigm that you think of things this way, but then you run into puzzles, and then we make some discovery, and that, that discovery is going to solve all the puzzles. Right? And then you find out it doesn't. Right? So then another discovery comes along. So we had game theory, and I think in kind of these, that time period, there was this idea that everything that wasn't explained by supply and demand could be explained by game theory. Turns out this was not true. <laughs> There are other things that still need to be explained. Now, what I'm going to suggest, though, is thinking about game theory not so much from the mainstream perspective, where, where it has been adopted and it does solve some puzzles, right? and, I, and I think this is also true within the Austrian view, but thinking about how Austrians can use game theory, uh, whether we can use game theory, how we can use game theory. Okay. All right. So I would first want to share, just very briefly, uh, Rothbard's view, because uh, he does mention game theory in Man, Economy, and State. Now, it's not in the main text. You have to go to the appendix to chapter one, where he lists out, he says, outside of economics, the rest of praxeology is an unexplored area. And then he has a list right, of various uh, areas that he would consider within praxeology, but as yet unexplored. And underneath this, he has the statement that a theory of games has been elaborated. Right? So he's already aware of game theory and did consider it to be underneath praxeology, that it is about the logic of action. And I think that that is accurate. Because what is praxeology really all about? Well, it's purposeful behavior, right? the fact that we have goals, we have ends we'd like to achieve, and we apply means to attain those goals. Now, when we think about a game theoretic structure, uh, every game has a structure that involves three elements. Right? That is, you have players, right? those that are trying to achieve things. So implicitly, there are ends here. Right? You also have strategies, that is, the, the various things you can do as you play through the game. So, the, I guess, the moves that you can make, right? uh, which we'd call strategies in terms of vocabulary, and then you have the outcomes, right? So it's not that hard, right, to take these three elements and see, yes, there is in fact a means-ends framework here, and we are analyzing the logic of how is it that players are making decisions, right, to try to achieve the best outcome for themselves, right, given the available strategies that is the means that are at their disposal to uh, reach whatever their goal happens to be. Now, my focus in this talk, uh, game theory, I could talk about for an entire course, uh, but I have 42 more minutes, right? So we're not gonna do that. I'm going to focus in on one specific slice of game theory, and we're mostly going to talk about the prisoner's dilemma, right? The reason I talk about the prisoner's dilemma is one, it's one of those things that was the puzzle, right, that potentially we could solve, right, with game theory. Uh, so it's exciting, right, to economists because of that. Uh, and also, I think it is probably a prisoner's dilemma type of setups is one that is most used to justify state intervention in overcoming right, individual choice right, and overriding individual choice. Right, so let's first just set up the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, some not, so let's go ahead and just lay this out. Uh, this is the traditional prisoner's dilemma. We have uh, two people, criminals, Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde are bank robbers. Uh, for the sake of making sure they're criminals, they are robbing 100% reserve gold-holding banks. <laughs> so it's clear who the criminal is right, in this story. Right? So they're going around, they're robbing banks, right? and law enforcement, uh, I assume private law enforcement, uh, catches up with them, because again, we want to know who the bad guys are. Right? So private law enforcement catches up with them, right? and you know, takes them into the station and separates them. So Bonnie in one room, Clyde in the other. And they offer this deal. They say, well, so let's just say they're talking to Clyde. So Clyde, here's the issue. Right? We know you've been out robbing banks. The problem is that you have plausible deniability a lot of the time, but we know we can get you on lesser charges. Right? We have enough evidence for that. Right? But a confession would be useful. So here's the deal. Right? In the next room, Bonnie is given the choice to either confess or not confess. Right? If she confesses to these more serious crimes and you also confess, you each go to prison for five years because that gives us enough evidence that you committed significant crimes, but you are also engaged with a plea bargain, so that's going to reduce the sentence somewhat. On the other hand, right, if when Bonnie confesses, you do not, right, Bonnie helped us put you away for a long time, so we're just going to let her go home. Right? Meanwhile, you go to prison for 10 years, she gave us the evidence we need for these serious crimes, and you didn't engage in plea bargaining. Right? On the other hand, right, if Bonnie does not confess in that next room, right, and you confess, then you get to go home today, 
right? And she goes to prison for 10 years. Now, if neither of you confess, we can still get you on these lesser charges, two years of prison each. Now, I'm going to bring in here a key assumption, and that is that neither Bonnie nor Clyde find prison desirable. Uh, sociologically, it doesn't seem like that's always true for some prisoners. <laughs> it seems like some cases uh, you do actually have people that you know, are released and like immediately commit another crime specifically because they want to go back to prison. Which, uh, <laughs> I don't know, that suggests there must be something we need to do with prison reform, I guess. But let's assume that these are not these people. Right? These people like to be outside of the prison system perhaps robbing banks, but perhaps doing other things as well, I don't know, going out to eat or what have you. All right, so Clyde thinks through the situation, and now I'm using a technique here. Uh, to, so what is happening here? We see all of the elements of the game, right? So we have Clyde and Bonnie are our players. Right? Uh, the rows are Clyde's possible strategies, confession, not confession. Uh, the columns are Bonnie's possible strategies, again, confessing and not confessing. And then we have all the outcomes are inside of that, showing all the different possible uh, combinations. So all the elements are in there. Now we need to add to this a solution strategy. Right, so how do we try to predict what they're going to do? Now I'm going to use the method of Nash equilibrium uh, in this case. Some, of, some places I'll deviate from it a little bit, so if you know the technicalities, uh, then you'll see those deviations. If you don't know the technicalities, don't worry about it. <laughs> there is an underlying logic to what I'm doing that I hope is clear regardless. All right, so what Nash equilibrium tells us though is that each of the prisoners uh, acts as if they have no control over the other. Right, so Bonnie's in the next room, I have no idea what she's doing. Right? I have no control over what she's doing, so all I can do is what's best for myself. Right? So Clyde reasons this way. He says, well, maybe Bonnie is confessing. Right? Maybe she is not particularly faithful to me as a partner in crime, in which case she confesses. So then my choice is either confessing as well, doing so defensively, so that I get five years in prison instead of 10, because I don't want to be in prison, so five years is preferable to 10. Right? Or maybe Bonnie is actually faithful as a partner in crime and she's not confessing in which case I have the opportunity to go home today if I just confess. So in either case, Clyde, con Clyde, con Clyde concludes it actually doesn't matter right, Bonnie, what Bonnie's doing next door, his best choice is to confess. Right? Uh, Bonnie in the next room runs through the same line of reasoning, offer being offered the same deal, and reaches the same conclusion, that it doesn't really matter what it is that Clyde is doing next door in terms of what her best choice is, in terms of the outcome certainly matters. Right? Right, so what we end up with, both of them conclude, best thing I can do is just confess, they both confess to the crime and therefore end up in prison for five years. Okay. Now, when we look at this, we conclude that that's not the best they could have done. Right? There is a better outcome available. Right? That is, if neither of them confessed, they'd both be better off. They'd, each, they'd save each other and, and themselves right, three years in prison. Right? Yet they have every reason not to do that. They have every reason to betray each other right, in the setup of the game. And this is why economists are very interested in this, because what happened here? Right? People are following what is individually clearly the best thing for them. Right? They, are, they have a very good reason to do what they did, yet at the end of the day, the outcome is not a very good one. It's a lousy outcome. And that is why this is something, oh, look at all the puzzles we can solve here. Now, as economists, we're not always particularly interested in uh, Bonnie and Clyde, particularly, uh, but we do have other situations that look very similar. Right? So the tragedy of the commons is one of those. And so with the tragedy of the commons, the kind of the image here, uh, we imagine a medieval village. And in this medieval village, there's a grassy area in the center of the village where everybody brings their cattle to graze. And this is called the commons. Right? Now the problem is that if everybody grazes all their cattle very intensively in this area, they're going to eat up all the grass, the thing devolves into a mud pit, and it's not very useful anymore. Right? So what we need to do is make sure we're somewhat moderate in our usage of the commons. But then we think about Bonnie and Clyde. Now they're no longer bank robbers, right? Now they are medieval peasants deciding how much they're going to use the commons. So I'm just going to boil this down to say either they use the commons and do so fairly intensively, or they don't use the commons. Okay. So thinking about Clyde again, right? So Clyde says, well, if Bonnie is going to use the, use the commons and I don't use them, they're totally useless to me. Right? Now, if I use them, they will end up as a mud pit, but I at least get some use out of them in the short term. Well, that's better than nothing. Right, so he is inclined in that case to actually lead to the desolation of the commons. Right? If on the other hand, Bonnie is not using the commons, then from Clyde's perspective, I can use them and use them forever. Because after all, right, my cattle alone are not going to devolve the thing into a mud pit. So that's an ideal case. Right? Right, so Clyde decides that regardless what Bonnie wants to do, right, the right decision for him is to go ahead and use the commons. Bonnie, reasoning the same way, decides to use the commons. 
The commons get used very intensively and eventually devolve into a mud pit. Uh, you see the same type of reasoning applied nowadays to things like overfishing in international waters, right? So we don't have good regulations here. So that means everybody's just going to pull all the fish out of the ocean. Fish populations are going to collapse and then eventually won't be, have any more fish. Right? So that's the type of argument we see made. Okay. All right. Or another case would be the case of public goods. Right? So the case of public goods, so imagine we're thinking about building a highway. Right. So the problem is that with, with what we call public good, there's this potential for you not to contribute to the funding of the good, uh, but nonetheless to use the good. Right. So uh, say in my case, I've been driving on the roads in Auburn here a little bit the past few days, but I don't really pay toward the road taxes in Auburn. I don't, I don't think I've even bought gas here recently, so I wouldn't even be contributing through the gas taxes. Right. Right. So, so I have the opportunity here to free ride, that is get the benefit of using the good without contributing right, to making sure that it gets provided. Right, so Bonnie and Clyde here are deciding, right, should they try to contribute to build these highways? Now, if they both contribute, then they can split the cost. Right, so they each pay, say, half the cost of this highway, and they each would get enough benefit that paying half the cost they think is worthwhile. Right, so here in the lower right, we have beautiful highways for all. The costs get split fairly in the sense that all of the participants say, yes, this was a good deal. Right, I'm getting more value from the thing than I had to pay for it. On the other hand, right, if one decides to fund it and the other decides to free ride, whoever funds it has to pay the whole cost. Right? Now, highways are expensive, right? so odds are that if you have to pay the entire cost of the highway, you're not going to get enough benefit from it for it to be worthwhile. On the other hand, if you didn't pay for it and you still get to use it, you get all the benefit with no cost whatsoever. Right? Now, if everybody free rides, uh, then nobody buys a car, or in this case, nobody buys the road. Right? So that is the classic question uh, that is often thrown to libertarians. Right? So, Clyde reasons through this. He says, well, suppose Bonnie wants to free ride. Well, I don't want to pay the entire cost of the road. It's not worth it. I'm not going to do that. Right? So he decides he's going to free ride as well. On the other hand, if Bonnie is willing to fund the thing, then Clyde is perfectly willing to free ride on it. Right? So in either case, right, then Clyde wants to free ride, as does Bonnie. So we end up right, with certainly what beats every libertarian in any debate we've ever participated in, who will build the roads? Right. Uh, clearly, in a libertarian society, roads are an impossibility. Okay. What we need is you know, state intervention, step in there, right? force people to do what's best for them. Right? Okay. All right. Uh, I don't believe that, so you know, don't take that quote out of context, please. All right. Okay, another argument. So uh, getting the economics here, a depression trap. So somebody that's more macro-oriented, perhaps like myself, uh, we see this type of reasoning coming uh, from, say, certain Keynesians of certain varieties, where they say, well, the reason we get stuck in a depression is that prices, wages, and the like are all too low. Right? If everybody would just give their employees raises, right, then we're willing to go out and buy stuff. That'll stimulate the economy. Right? Right. Let's just take this at face value to show how the game theory works, what's happening in their minds. Right? Right, so, uh, Clyde and Bonnie here, right, uh, they are no longer thinking about uh, you know, using commons, or they're no longer thinking about building roads. Instead, they're thinking about paying their employees. And they have the choice, right? Either keep your wages low or increase them. Now, Clyde says, well, if Bonnie decides to keep her wages low, if I increase my wages, then all that benefit's going to go to Bonnie. Because my employees are going to go and buy stuff from her. She has the same cost as before, but her revenue just went up. She gets the benefit, and all I get is the cost. It doesn't make sense. On the other hand, if I keep my wages low too, yeah, we're in a depression, right? But things are at least not getting worse for me than they currently are. Uh, meanwhile, if Bonnie decides to increase wages, I could increase wages too and we get a broad expansion, but then I'm seeing both my costs and my revenue go up. It's not really a big gain in terms of profit. On the other hand, right, if I keep my wages low while Bonnie decides to increase wages, then I get the profit. Her employees are going to spend some of that money in my business. I get more revenue. My costs still stay low. I got the profit. She took the cost. So I want to keep my wages low, as does Bonnie. End result, we end up with this depression trap. We just cannot escape unless there is some way to get wages to go up in some organized fashion. So these are the typical conclusions we see when people use the prisoner's dilemma. And this is also certainly why interventionists would love this type of argument is what do we end up with? People are choosing optimally from an individual perspective. The logic all makes sense. Right? Individually, when we reason through why you decided to confess, why you decided not to fund the road, why you decided to not raise wages, it all makes sense from an individual perspective. Nonetheless, at the end of the game, 
right? We all agree, right? that is, the players themselves agree. This isn't some outside force that says, oh, it would have been a better world and the players disagree. No, the players themselves agree it would have been a better outcome right? if, they had done the, if everyone had done the opposite. So that clearly proves that we need government to step in, force wages up in the middle of depressions. It's no accident that the federal minimum wage in the United States came about in the 1930s. This was the exact argument that was being made, that oh, wages are all too low, we need to force them up. Businesses aren't doing it by themselves, we make a law to make them do it. Right? Or fund public goods with taxes. So just make Clyde and Bonnie each contribute to building that highway, and in fact, they'll be thankful that they were forced to contribute to this thing because the, in the end of the day, they'll say, yeah, I don't love the taxes, I'd rather not pay them, but better for all of us to pay taxes and get these goods than not. Right? Or we need to regulate the use of the commons. Right? We need to make sure that you know, there only so much fishing happens, so we don't lose all of our fish populations. Right? Or we need to keep prisoners from confessing. Now, okay, that's, that may not be the case for the law enforcement in our scenario, although we certainly can't imagine some cases where there are certain prisoners that we don't want to confess if we're in the political system now. I'll just... <laughs> Because I don't want this video to get tagged on YouTube, I won't give any specific examples, but I'm sure we can think of some. All right, so, so uh, that might actually be true <laughs> in certain cases. All right, what I want to do now is show that if we consider the idea of entrepreneurship and acknowledge that it exists, which is a weakness of the mainstream, uh, they tend not to acknowledge that entrepreneurs are a thing, right? uh, if we acknowledge that entrepreneurship exists, that changes the story in significant ways. All right, so let me lay out how I'm going to think of entrepreneurship here and tie it to the Austrian tradition. So looking at just you know, two views of entrepreneurship, certainly you've heard other views expressed here as well. Right, so I'm not really pulling that much from the Kleinian view of entrepreneurs as exercising judgment. Uh, instead, I'm pulling from the Misesian view. I, I believe that Mises himself more emphasized this idea of foresight. That is, that entrepreneurship, we know, is acting under uncertainty. Right? So what makes you successful as an entrepreneur is having keen foresight. Right? So that is, you can see what is going to happen amongst this cloud of uncertainty in a way that others cannot. And just to give some defense that this uh, is at least reflective of Mises' view, uh, in chapter 24 of Human Action, Mises says, the ultimate source of profit is always the foresight of future conditions. Then in chapter 38, he adds, uh, getting a little bit more specific with this, that it's not just you know, having some kind of foresight, but specifically having foresight better than others have. Right? So it is something you would have a, a comparative advantage in. Or, yeah. All right, so, so foresight is one element. Now the other is the Kersnerian element of alertness. Uh, so, Kirsten really thinking of entrepreneurship as a seizing of opportunities. You do see the seizing of opportunities language also in Mises. He, he does actually make this type of statement as well. Uh, but so if you're seizing opportunities, what you need to do is know that they exist. Right? So it's somebody with good eyesight. Uh, so I would be ruled out certainly. <laughs> and it's also true not, not just like literally in terms of my eyesight, but in terms of entrepreneurial opportunities. Uh, I mentioned in my uh, talk for the advanced session this morning, uh, for a while I had a, a brokerage account with $1.19 in it. Um, because I'm not very good at entrepreneurial foresight. It started with more, ended up with $1.19. All right, so you are alert to opportunities uh, that arise uh, as a Kersnerian, so these opportunities exist, you're the one that sees them, foresight, right, you see them coming, okay? So it's these two elements together. And what I want to suggest then is that if we revisit the prisoner's dilemma with this idea in mind, that our players are not simply you know, calculating robots trying to draw arrows, right, within this diagram, but instead that they have some, some level of foresight, some level of alertness, and some level of creativity, being something that I would add into this, right, which I guess is more Schumpterian as far as that goes. So add creativity to it. And entrepreneurs don't just declare the game lost. That is, oh, well, I guess we just have to confess. Right? See you in five years. Right? Instead, we find ways to change the game. Right? So, in fact, game theorists already know, and this is not having to appeal just to Austrians, like within the mainstream of game theory, we know that there are a number of solutions right, to the prisoner's dilemma, things you can do that change the game. Uh, most obviously, something like repeating the game. Right, so if we know this is a game you're going to play not just once, but repeatedly, that then opens up a whole range of strategies that would not be available otherwise. That is where you can respond right, to what has been done previously. So one famous strategy that fits into this particular um, framework would be the tit-for-tat strategy. Right, so it's simply, I do whatever you did in the previous round. Right, right, so what this has implicitly in it is a punishment-reward structure. 
right? So if, in fact, right, we have our partners in crime of Bonnie and Clyde, and they have an understanding right, that if you betray me now, I will betray you later, right? and there will be a later because we are partners in crime, we do this kind of thing continuously, that changes the way we behave because we're not just thinking about this prison sentence, we're thinking about all the prison sentences over the course of our career. Okay. Right, so knowing this, I suspect that entrepreneurs are probably at least as, as smart in these situations that they actually have to face, right, as the game theorists looking at it from outside are. Okay. So let's re-envision game theory. Right, so the key assumption in all these games as I presented them is that the game was fixed. Right? With entrepreneurs, this is often not going to be true. Right? They will find ways to change the structure of the game. They will find new strategies. They will find ways to tweak the outcomes so they can end up with a different outcome that is better than just ending up trapped in whatever the prisoner's dilemma claims. So what we need to do as economists looking at these situations is we first need to ask the question, oh, this looks like a prisoner's dilemma. Right? How might entrepreneurs try to improve the game? We know there's a better outcome. Right? Creative people want to try to get better outcomes and will think about how to do this. So what might they do? What are some possibilities? Now, entrepreneurs themselves will probably beat us to this, which means then we need to ask the second question. If they're not doing it, then why aren't they? There's probably something we're missing right, in our analysis. Right? So it might be something like hidden costs. One thing, uh, if any of you ever end up as an economics professor, one thing that I would definitely encourage you to do if you're teaching especially principles level students is do some demonstrations in class of these things because they almost never work. And the fact that they almost never work is an interesting thing because that allows you to bring in some of the details that get passed over when we're just looking at PowerPoint screens. Right? So I actually had, uh, for, for many years when I started teaching, I had students play out a form of the prisoner's dilemma. Um, unfortunately, I was not allowed to lock them away for two or five years. Right? But instead, I offered candy bars. Right? So, okay, so here's a chocolate bar. Right? If you play the nice way, you each get three chocolate bars. If you play the mean way, you each get one chocolate bar. Right? Or if you play that, that mixed way, one person's nice, whoever's one is mean, whoever's mean gets all four chocolate bars or something like that, the other person gets nothing. Right? So it's the same kind of structure. Just, just kind of invert it, change the years of prison into chocolate bars, and you're good to go. Right? And one thing that I found was that it's, ex it's extremely rare Right, for principles of economic students to actually play the prisoner's dilemma right. right? Like you don't end up right, with this prediction. So what's going on? And I would ask them. Right? So one thing that I found sometimes happened was that some students just didn't understand the game. They were just new to this. Right? Right, so they made mistakes. And that's something that happens. Right? After we do make mistakes with the choices we make. Entrepreneurs are not perfect. Right? So they do sometimes make errors. Right? So that is something that happens. Another thing I found was that sometimes I had I, my incentive structure was all wrong. Right? That is, the student would come down and say, I need a couple volunteers for a demonstration. OK, you two come down. That makes sense. You're the two that actually participate in class anyway. Right? So they come down. And then I tell them what the game is. And one person. <laughs> You know, ends up walking away with nothing. I say, well, why did you, why'd you play the game that way? I say, well, I don't like chocolate bars. <laughs> okay, right. so, so I, I missed something there. My incentives were all wrong, right? And another thing that happens sometimes right, is that reputation matters. Right? I, I'm not locking these students away in secret rooms where nobody's watching what they do. Instead, they are acting out, are they a nice cooperative person? Are they a mean traitor, right? In front of 50 of their peers. Okay, I want to look like a nice person to all these people because I might need help later on in the course, right? So you act like a cooperative person, right? So this idea of reputation, having some sense of morality, can change the way that we behave in this game. So in this case, there's a hidden, in effect, a moral or reputational cost, right, that is built into the game that we may easily miss. If we, and that's a case of us, we got the, we got the outcomes wrong. But we missed part of the outcome. Okay, right, so... So we need to think about these questions. So what might entrepreneurs do to try to improve the game? If they're not improving the game, why aren't they? Is there perhaps some hidden cost? Or maybe there is some rule that is preventing it the, the entrepreneurs can't get around. Right? That is something that can happen. And often, to find those rules, you start looking through regulations. Right? Okay, here it is. They're not actually allowed to participate in you know, trying to solve this puzzle. Okay. All right. So I want to give a couple examples then of using game theory wrong. Oh, I've already done it. <laughs> so all these previous examples about things like depressions and wages, the tragedy of the commons, public goods, these are all cases where if we just take them too literally and say, well, we end up with a bad outcome, right, then we've used game theory in my mind wrong. We've not asked the right question yet. How might entrepreneurs fix these games? And if they're not, why aren't they? 
something. You stop too soon. Right? But I would note that Austrians are also not immune. So I think that Austrians have accepted that game theory can be a useful thing in explaining certain phenomena. It is part of praxeology. It fits within the praxeological framework. Unfortunately, we do also see uh, certain uh, Austrians that sometimes fall into saying, well, there's a prisoner's dilemma. I guess we just lose. Right? Uh, this is one example of that. It's uh, Karelian Dempster in their paper in 2001. Although I want to be careful here because one of these people is currently uh, reviewing my promotion file that's going to be put in the fall. <laughs> so I hope they're not watching. All right. So they th they're thinking about this question. So that comes up, the Austrians get faced with this all the time from the rational expectations folks. Like, well, okay, so you have this idea of the entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are supposed to re be really smart and creative. Right? Well, why don't they ever anticipate the business cycle and just not do it? Right. And the idea of anticipation, just meaning the business cycle doesn't happen, is not original to the rational expectations, folks. It's original to Mises. Mises, in the theory of money and credit, as he's forming his theory of the business cycle, mentions that if everybody understood it, it wouldn't happen. Right. Okay, that raises the question, why does it still happen? Right. Do people just not understand it or what? Right. So what Carilli and Dempster do, they say, well, it's a game theoretic framework. So even if people understand it, we have very good entrepreneurs, rational, understand Austrian business cycle theory. They still have every reason to participate in the boom. Here's their argument. Now, I, I kind of fear this is starting to get repetitive. <laughs> These feel very similar. Okay. All right, so let's walk through it. So they imagine, let's focus on one firm. We'll just call it firm X. And they're thinking about what they want to do versus all other firms are also acting in, in similar fashions. And so they have this choice. So we're in the early stages of the boom. Right? I could increase investment specifically in those upper stages of the capital structure, right? or I could maintain investment at its old levels, just act like right, the credit expansion isn't happening and just try to ignore that. Right? So what happens? Well, if everybody else is increasing investment and I increase investment, then I'm at least maintaining my relative profits equal to what everybody else's is. Right? So it doesn't look like I'm falling behind. Right? Of course, this also results in the boom-bust cycle. Right? On the other hand, if I maintain investment, the problem is that there are profits to be made during the boom, which means that relatively, my profit's going to fall behind everybody else's. Right? And that doesn't feel desirable. On the other hand, if everybody else maintains investment, and I think about increasing it, well, I'm a small firm in a rather large economy, Odds are I'm not going to create much of a boom-bust cycle, which means that if I participate and increase investment, I'm just earning a profit that is higher than everybody else's. On the other hand, if nobody participates, so everybody maintains investment, our relative profits all stay the same, and there's no boom and bust. So looking at the options, Firm X says, well, if everybody else increases investment, I don't want to fall behind, so I'm going to increase investment as well. On the other hand, if everybody else is maintaining investment, I want to take advantage of the opportunity and have higher profits than others. So I'm going to go ahead and increase investment. So we increase investment. Now, because firm X is reasoning this way, so will firm A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, right? so all other firms also reason this way, and we end up, even though everybody knows the business cycle is going to happen, right? because we don't want to fall behind in profits, we end up all participating in the boom and creating the business cycle. Okay. I think there are a few issues with this. Right? So just kind of first a couple quibbles. Right? One is this takes a strikingly short-term perspective right, for those that are investing. Right? One of the, the traits that we should have amongst the capitalists that are funding these kinds of projects is that you have a relatively low time preference and a long time horizon. Right? So you're not just thinking about what do profits look like tomorrow. Right? So the fact that we're focusing on what does relative profit look like in this next phase of the boom, that strikes me as a bit funny in the reasoning. Another quibble is this idea of relative profit, and that I suspect that what uh, entrepreneurs actually look at is not how am I doing relative to other entrepreneurs, but how am I doing relative to the other opportunities that are available to me. Right? So we're looking at the wrong set of choices that the entrepreneur has to make. But more relevant to this particular lecture, they're not asking the right question. Right? And the right question is, why don't firms organize right, to prevent the increased investment which will hurt them all in the long run? Right. Uh, this is a point, actually, that Murray Rothbard made in a separate context, where he says there's this one argument where certain game theorists say, well, we shouldn't be worried about cartels because they're all going to betray each other. Right? So they're stuck in this prisoner's dilemma, and they're going to act competitive. Right? So this sounds kind of nice. And Rothbard says, no, no, no. Right? All that's going to happen is they're just going to merge. <laughs> so they're going to merge together. They're going to find some way of enforcing this cartel right, to happen. 
gee, if only there was somebody that did economic history on cronyism to talk about cartels using the power of the state to uh, enforce their interests. I, I feel like there might be a couple books related to this, one being released soon, but it's not mine, so I'm not going to say whose it is. <laughs> you know. All right. Right, so, so that's the question. So why is it that suddenly they can't organize right, when they have every reason to? And in fact, we find that firms are often very good at finding ways to organize, even if it means calling on the power of, state to make, the, power of the state to make it happen. Right, so they stopped too soon. They didn't ask that next question. Now, what about using game theory right? Now, I suggest that if we want to use game theory right, we need to acknowledge that game theory will inform us about those cases when entrepreneurs are going to seek creative institutional solutions to these nasty problems. Right? They're going to find ways to change the game. Right? So starting at a very small scale. Uh, there's a, a British game show that was on a while back called Golden Balls. And the idea of this game, I, I never watched an entire episode, uh, was that you had a couple of participants that would participate in various activities that would lead to some sum of money, that then at the end of the um, show, they would have this choice of splitting or stealing. So here's the structure of the game. Right? So in this particular case, I'm going to talk about the participants were named Nick and Abraham. Uh, and you have the choice of either, you have these two golden balls in front of you, inside one of them is the word steal, inside the other is the word split. Now you as the player get to choose which of these two you reveal, so it's not random or anything like that. You choose, I want to play the steal ball or I want to play the split ball. Okay. And here are what the outcomes are. And so if everybody plays steal, then everybody walks away empty handed. Right. Now this is the win condition for the network. Okay. If everybody plays split, then they split the money in half. Right. So. Half of the money, right, in this case, it was a 50,000 pot, I believe, or so. Right, so 50,000 pounds, they're dividing between them. It's a British game show. Right, so split, you get 25,000 apiece. Right? Now, if one plays split and the other plays steal, then whoever plays steal gets the whole thing, and whoever plays split gets nothing. Right? So let's go ahead and analyze this. So this is the one I mentioned before. This one is not quite a prisoner's dilemma. It's similar in character, but a little bit different. Right, so go through Nick's reasoning. So Nick says, well, if Ibrahim plays steal, I get nothing regardless. So it really doesn't matter what I do in that case. That's what makes this different from a prisoner's dilemma. Right? So this is this case where Nick doesn't actually care what he does. Right? On the other hand, right, if Nick plays split, then I can get more money by playing steel. So I do have a reason to play steel and no reason to play split. So I do have some reason to move that direction. Uh, Abraham walking through the same line of reasoning reaches the same conclusion. Right, that you know, Playing steel, there's a benefit to. Playing split, there really isn't. Right? So it makes sense, at least in some cases, you're going to be better off by playing steel. So if both of them follow through with this, what we end up with is that they both play steel. The network is very happy because then they don't have to pay anything and they get all of the ad revenue from this uh, game. So, but in this case, right, they happen to have a very entrepreneurial uh, contestant. His name was Nick. And Nick said, I'm going to change the to this game. So unlike Bonnie and Clyde, who are placed in separate rooms, because that makes terrible television, uh, they would allow right, these two players to discuss ahead of time. Now, the way it typically played out, of course, was that the two players say to each other, oh, I'm obviously going to play Split. I have all of my family watching at home. They, I want to show them I'm a good person, or the whole world is watching. That's not true, but at least the whole country is watching. Uh, so it's all trying to convince the other person how good you are, and therefore you're going to magnanimously play Split, and then inevitably somebody's going to play Steel. Right. That's not what Nick does. Nick takes a radically different strategy in this negotiation round. Right. And here's what he says. Right. He says, I'm telling you, Ibrahim, I promise you, I will play steel. That's like saying, I promise you I'm a terrible person or something. But I'm, I promise you I'm going to play steel, but right, I'm also going to then take that money and divide it evenly between us. Huh. I mean, this isn't outside the realm of possibility, right? I mean, it's your money. You can do what you want with it. And I'm not totally familiar with British case law, but it's, it might even be possible that in this offer, if it gets accepted, it might actually be a verbal contract, right? So the context might prevent that. I'm not sure, right? But at the very least, he presented a, a reasonable possibility of a story here. He says, I'm going to steal, and then I'll give you half of it, which means then, uh, Ibrahim, that if you play steal, we both walk away with nothing. We know that's true because I'm going to play steel guaranteed. Right? So your only hope of getting anything right, is to play split. Now, Ibrahim reacts <laughs> very much like I expect most people at home did. Like, 
you are insane. He literally said that. Like, you are insane. I may have used a different, more British word, but that was the, the thrust of it. You, you're, you're nuts. But let's walk through what he just did to the game. Okay. So assuming that he is believable, assuming that we believe Nick is not lying about being a terrible person, but, but somewhat magnanimous and willing to split this pot, what did he do? So he just made it so for he himself, it doesn't matter what he plays anymore, right? Right. as long as he's telling the truth. Right? So if he in fact does uh, follow, wait, no, it doesn't matter what he plays, looking at what, each of what Ibrahim does. So if Ibrahim steals, Nick is gonna get nothing regardless. That was always true. Right? If Abraham plays split, now Nick gets 25 regardless. So it really doesn't matter right, what uh, Nick does at this point, as long as he's willing to follow through with what he said. Uh, Abraham, on the other hand, his structure just changed right, in a very important way. So if he believes Nick, that Nick is going to steal, it used to be that Abraham really didn't care what he did. He was going to get zero regardless. Now there's the potential of getting 25, right? which means that if Nick plays steal, Abraham wants to play split. Hmm. So we just introduced a reason to play this good outcome. Right. On the other hand, now if Nick plays split, if he was in fact lying about being a bad person, right, then, then Ibrahim still wants to steal. So that means that at this point, right, Ibrahim is torn. Right? It's really down to, does he believe that Nick is a bad enough person to play steal or not, but yet a good enough person to split at the end of the day? Right? Ooh, right, that's rough. Right? So, so what would we predict would happen? Well, looking at this, right, it's not so obvious. But now if he does believe Nick, and like knowing that Nick doesn't really have a strong reason to do either anymore as long as that split part is true, right? if he believes and says, okay, he may as well play steel, well, in that case, we would end up with this outcome. Right? Exactly what Nick is offering would happen. Turns out that's not how the game played. Right? Nick's ploy, I guess a gambit, right? so the Nick gambit here, worked in convincing Ibrahim to go ahead and play split. And then Nick played split because it didn't really make any difference. So it turns out Nick, by being a liar, <laughs> ended up with a good outcome, right? Which is amazing. Okay, so he ended up with the good outcome, 25,000 each, not the one that I've circled, but the one just below it, where it's the network dividing the money rather than Nick doing it. So this is the kind of thing that we can see happen if we have entrepreneurial players that think about the structure of the game, think about tweaks they can make to it. We can end up with different outcomes being possible. We no longer end up trapped right, in this worst outcome. So do we see this applied, say, in a larger context? Yes. Uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto, in his book, uh, Money, Bank, Credit, and uh, Economic Cycles, uh, describes the credit expansion this way. Here on page 667, he has actually like, like this exact framework, if you look in that book at that page. He says, suppose we have these two banks thinking about engaging in credit expansion. Now, Bank A, let's just reason through for them, they know that if Bank B does not expand their credit, and Bank A does not expand, we'll both survive, right? we're both operating on a prudentiary basis, right? we're, we're not going to have any problems with bank runs or anything like that, and we're going to earn a small profit on whatever fees we charge for our services. Right? Right. On the other hand, uh, if bank B does not expand but bank A does, then bank A ends up failing. Right? By expanding your credit too much, you end up your reserves get uh, pushed over into bank B, you go bankrupt. Right? So that's not going to be very good, uh, not for bank A at the very least being the one deciding to expand. On the other hand, if Bank B expands, Bank A could not expand, in which case they certainly survive. They're running on a nice prudential basis. But, but on the other hand, if they expand, then everybody is expanding. We wouldn't expect to see all the reserves moving from one bank to the other. We all get to survive and earn large profits as we get fees not just for services, but we also get uh, the money we get from bank loans, that in those interest payments. All right, so reason through this. It's not a prisoner's dilemma. It's a different type of game. It's what we call a coordination game. All right, so Bank A says, well, if Bank B doesn't expand, I don't want to either because I don't want to fail. On the other hand, if Bank B does expand, I also want to expand because those large profits look nice. And Bank B says the same. So this is a case where we have two different possibilities. We could have nobody expanding, and that would be a stable result, or we could have everybody expanding, and that would be a stable result. So the way that this is explained by DeSoto, he says you have the possibility then of kind of these two banking cultures that would emerge. You could have a prudent banking system that don't expand, thanks to this fear of failure if they tried to expand individually. Or we could have a, a culture of imprudent bankers that all expand. Right? Like both of these would be potentially stable solutions. But it is also true that when, if we go back, right, all the banks want to end up in that less prudent expansionary result because then they earn more profit. Right? So the question is, how do we organize things in such a way that everybody expands? 
That's what the central bank is for. Right? So we create a central bank and it changes the game for us. Right? So how does it do it? Right here. Right? So in any case where you would have failed, instead of failing, you get bailed out by the central bank acting as a lender of last resort or whatever to make sure that you don't go under. Right? So I just replaced then where it says bank B gets bailed out, they would have failed before. Bank A gets bailed out for a small profit, they, they would have failed before. So how does this change the game? Right, so now bank A says, well, if bank B doesn't expand, it really doesn't matter what I do. Right? So I get a small profit regardless, either by getting bailed out so we're okay, or by just earning the fees and acting as a prudent bank. Right? Or if bank B expands, then I definitely want to expand and get that large profit rather than simply surviving. Right? Right, so we have some reason to go ahead and expand. Now there's no benefit to not expanding. It doesn't protect me from anything because the central bank is providing the protection. And that's where we end up. Right. So thanks to the central bank, we can now allow for an imprudent banking system to happen. Right? So this would be what I would consider using game theory right. right. We have these different predictions going on. We think about how would the banking system try to change this game to result in something that's more beneficial to them, right? and they do it. And we have actually seen this play out as we know in history. Right? So we get creatures from Jekyll Island and the like. All right. There are also other solutions as well, apart from these little one-off things. So in general, I already mentioned repeated games being one potential solution. So we see things like partners in crime, where we know we are going to play this game multiple times. Uh, by design, that was the hope of what the WTO and its predecessor GATT was going to do. But, you know, Dr. Dorabat talked about these different rounds of negotiations. That was supposed to be like we're playing this game different uh, multiple times, so then we're going to be more nice and making good trade policy or something like that. Of course, the whole thing has fallen apart at this point, but by design, that's what they were hoping for. You can also have the possibility of enforcers. I like to call this breaking the confessor's kneecaps. So in this case, uh, there's every reason for Bonnie and Clyde to have a third partner. Uh, their job is not to participate in any of the bank robberies, but just if anybody confesses, as soon as they walk out of the station, they get their kneecaps broken, right? or, or get horses' heads put in, their, put in their beds or something like that. Right? So what does this do? It changes the payoff from the outcome. Like, okay, I don't go to prison, but there's something else to be paid. Right? And that can change our behavior. Right? Or with the tragedy of the commons in particular, we know that privatizing them is an option. Right? So put a fence in the middle of the commons, this is Bonnie's, this is Clyde's, and then because they each have their own side, they want to make sure it doesn't evolve into a mud pit. And we do see this actually happen. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom also talks about other ways that we've seen communities in this type of situation where we would predict a tragedy of the commons would occur, but it doesn't. Because communities are smart, right, and they find solutions. And they find a number of maybe different in the particulars, but she documents, you know, uh, common elements to the solutions that we find. So the tragedy of the commons, it turns out, very rarely actually happens. Right? Okay. All right, and then public goods, one possibility is something like creating a matching fund. Right? So what if we change the game right, so that Bonnie says, yes, I'm willing to pay for half the money as long as Clyde is willing to pay for half the money? Make that a possibility. Right? So I'll only pay if they pay. Now we all have a reason to pay and provide the highways. And we do see this actually implemented in things like Kickstarter. So if you're not familiar with this website, the way Kickstarter works is that there's this overall pledge goal for a particular project, and the pledges only have to be paid if that goal is met. Right? So I can say, yes, I want to make sure this thing happens, so I'm willing to provide, say, I don't know, $50 or something like that. Right? If there aren't enough other people that are willing to provide it, I never have to pay the 50. But I do pay the 50 if enough people are willing to commit to make the thing actually happen. And we see projects being funded this way. Uh, Reading Rainbow is one, uh, it was several years ago now. This was um, when I was a kid, I remember watching Reading Rainbow. It was a PBS show. It was on for like 20 years or something like that. LeVar Burton trying to convince kids to read, basically. So a lot of us have very firm, nostalgic feelings about this program. So it raised $5 million right, on Kickstarter. Right? It didn't have to go to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and convince people to fund right, this, I believe it was an app they were trying to develop, right, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm also interested in kind of the, the tabletop role-playing game e range of the world. Right? And you see, find many small publishers, uh, things not you know, the big guy at Hasbro, right, that are funding these uh, projects very successfully. Like one really little one, like the, the company I believe is literally one person, right, managed to raise, I believe it was about a, one and a half million dollars for a game. Right, through this, because people drummed up interest, wanted to make sure the project happened, and were willing to pledge enough combined to make sure the project happened. That wasn't the most successful. I think more recently is uh, MCDM, as Matt Colville, he's a, a YouTuber that talks about things in this range. I think he raised about as much money as Reading Rainbow did for his game. Right, so we see this can actually work for these types of things. All right, so there are solutions out there right, for these problems. 
So just to wrap up then, uh, when we approach game theory, right, we can do it the wrong way, and the wrong way is all too often what we see. Where we end up, we just say, oh, we ended up with lousy outcomes from individual choice. The obvious solution then is to eliminate individual choice. Right? Or we can use game theory the right way and start thinking about the fact that lousy outcomes are exactly what will attract entrepreneurs to try to solve them. Right? Creative people coming up with solutions, seeing opportunities here that are possible and, and foreseeing them, so perhaps they never occur in the first place. Right? So what are they doing right, to fix these issues? If they're not fixing them, what's standing in the way? Right? That's the way that I believe we should use game theory. Thank you. <laughs>